Hello, and welcome to Crushing Classical, redefining a thriving classical music career. I'm Tracy Friedlander, and I'm so happy that you're joining me for this episode. Today on the show, I have Peter Askim, who is a bass player, composer, and conductor. I wanted to have him on the show today to talk about his multifaceted career and tell us all about the summer festival that he created. This summer, the next festival for emerging artists is in its fifth season. On this episode, you'll hear Peter tell us all about his festival, which he calls the Anti-Festival. You'll find out why he calls it that. And we talk all about his mission and his reason for starting the festival. And we talked about money, what it's like to make money as a musician who does all these different things, composes, performs, and conducts, and his stance on money with the festival and how it differs from other festivals and how he approaches this with his participants. It was a great talk hearing all about this new kind of festival and how it differs from other ones. But before we get started, I want to thank Fix Music for providing the hosting for the show. When you're looking for high quality sheet music at affordable prices, look no further than fixmusic.com. And get this, they are making so many improvements to their website. Starting now, they have lots of music for all strings as well as continuing to add music for winds and brass. They've also improved the checkout to use real-time quotes for priority two to three days and priority express overnight shipments if you need it fast. And unlike many of their competitors, they do not pad these methods to make more money. If you need it fast, they will get it to you as cheaply as possible. They have also started piloting a program where they set up a portal for schools and teachers. Teachers can pick the music that appears in the portal and can easily point students to that page. And that's how students will find the right music to buy and get it to them at a great price and get it quickly. Contact them for more information through their website, fixmusic.com. And for Crushing Classical listeners, just for you, get 10% off your order by using the code CRUSH on your order. Check them out at fixmusic.com. And don't forget to check out the Fireside Chat series, a new series that comes out every Sunday, where Eileen, my crushing classical partner, and I have candid discussions on topics that impact career building. And come join the conversation on Facebook.com slash Crushing Classical and Instagram at Crushing Classical. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's get started. Hey, Peter, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Great. Good. Thanks I, for being on. Totally. I'm really excited to do this. I really love your show. Great. That's awesome. So you, I know you from North Carolina Symphony, and actually I really got to know you through working with your orchestras at NC State. So you are you are the main conductor at North Carolina State, right? Right. Yeah. And then you compose and play the bass. So tell me a little bit about your career, because you have, you, you're a It's three, it's multifaceted and you do so many things. So were you always um, on the conductor track and composer track or were you at the beginning, were you just thinking you were going to get a bass job? Tell me more about that. Yeah, no. So I kind of had a a, a bunch of different phases in my career. I I started out as a bass player and always wanted to to be playing. Um, And so I, I went through college and grad school and, and, and got my DMA as a bass player, um, and got a job in Honolulu symphonies. And I was out there for, uh, eight or nine seasons, uh, playing in the orchestra there. And while I was there, I was also doing a lot of composing and started conducting the contemporary music ensemble at the university of Hawaii and, and doing a lot of teaching there, a bunch of different things. Okay. Uh, and I've always been really curious about all kinds of different aspects of making music. And, and I've always felt like, you know, if I learn more as a conductor, it helps my playing. And if I learn more as a player, it helps my writing. And if my writing helps my conducting. And, and so yeah. it, it's all kind of the same, the same basic stuff to me, um, and just how it kind of gets manifested, um, has changed over, over time. But, um, I've always done a little bit of all three at the same time. And okay. uh, now I'm now I'm doing more conducting and composing, but I'm still playing, um, and I enjoy that um, when I'm in shape, at least. <laughs> when I'm not <laughs> in shape, which gets harder, I have to say, uh, I yeah. enjoy it a little bit less. And and 
The reports are that most other people enjoy it a little bit less when I'm out of shape too. But anyway, we're getting <laughs> off the topic. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it was kind of an uh, uh, an evolution from from playing to playing and composing to conducting and playing and composing to conducting and composing and playing. I see. Yeah. So when you were so you got a doctorate intentionally thinking you were going to teach somewhere in a university? Is that why you did that? No, like that? no, actually not. You know, I never I never wanted to be a base doctor. I mean, that was not my my, not my <laughs> goal. Um, no, I, I was studying with Don Palma and uh, he had just gotten there. I was at Yale School of Music um, and I really loved working with him and, and I had only had, you know, a year or two to work with him. And so I just decided, well, I'd love to to, to work with him some more. Um, he's an amazing player, an amazing teacher, amazing guy. So I said, well, I'll just, you know, do the doctoral program. I actually didn't really think about university teaching. I was really focused on on making music and performing at that point. Um, but it was a great chance to study with Don, and it was a great school. And um, so I just did that and, and, uh, and ended up getting the doctorate. And uh, it's come in handy since then, which is yeah. good. But it, was, it wasn't kind of a, a straight shot arrow goal um, of mine. And strangely enough, I actually, I actually have two. I got, a, I got another DMA um, in composition. I, I had been out in Honolulu for all that time and then decided to take a sabbatical and go back to school um, because I was restless and curious and, and wanted to, to spend some time on composing. So I actually got a second doctorate. Um, so I have one in performance and one in composition, which I think is kind of interesting considering I didn't want even one in the first place. But there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of student loan debt too, isn't it? Uh, well, you know, I had I had pictures of the dean, so I got a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like a little blackmail to get your your scholarship up up to uh, living wage. So, anyway, that that was a joke, by the way. I hope he's not listening. <laughs> that's one thing I know about you is you have a dry sense of humor. But I think <laughs> <laughs> dry is a very nice word. You're very kind. <laughs> Um, so did you consider auditioning more for other orchestras? Yeah. Yeah. I was in Honolulu and, um, I was doing a bunch of auditions and, um, you know, was interested in, in, you know, work getting in a, in a orchestra on the mainland or, or one that paid more or, you know, yeah. um, and then at a certain point I just decided that it wasn't really what I wanted. Um, you know, that I could, if, if I got a bigger job, it wouldn't, it wouldn't kind of solve all of the things that I was interested in you know in fact right. a bigger a bigger playing job would actually leave me less time for um composing and conducting so um that was when i decided to to take some time off and go back to school for composing and then i then i never went back to playing full time after that i got another job at that point uh-huh so it was sort of like when you quit honolulu was there was it just sort of organically you're being led towards doing those other things, doing composing and, and conducting? So, Yeah, just... I think so. Yeah. I mean, I originally just took a year off and then, um, then I got the I, – I spent a year at UT Austin um, studying there, which was great as a composer. And at the end of, at the end of my time there, I got a job offer to be the music director and composer in residence at Idlewild Arts in California. So I, at that point, I decided that, you know, it would be more interesting for me to be a composer and conductor um, than to go back to Honolulu where, you know, I already knew how to, how to do that. Um, so I wanted to, to keep on moving forward. And, it, and so it, it did work out, you know, organically. It, was, um, it wasn't, you know, an easy decision because I, I, loved, I loved playing and I loved being in the orchestra, but ultimately it was definitely the right one for me. Right. And now you have a festival. So I really want to talk about your festival. What's the festival about? So the festival is called The Next Festival of Emerging Artists. And I started this festival because I felt like there was something missing in the, the kind of chain of events of, of, of young people um, playing instruments and going to college and then going to grad school. And then then what? You yeah. know, like between that and a job, um, which doesn't happen right away for everybody, how do you make that that leap from from one from one 
state of being, like the student state of being, to to being a working musician. And, um, you know, teaching is really important for me. And I've had great teachers in my life, um, people who I could never really repay. And so the way that I felt like I could kind of repay them was to, to kind of try and do something for the next generations. So I started this festival. This is the fifth year now, which is hard to believe. Um, and I started it to be what I call the anti-festival, right? So mm-hmm. most festivals that I know, you know, are like hyper-scheduled where you run from a coaching to a rehearsal to a lesson and back to, you know, another rehearsal. And then you pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And yeah. I didn't think that this was, you know, particularly helpful um, for everybody, at least at a certain stage. You know, I mean, all of the great big, huge festivals are fantastic um, and they serve a purpose. And there's no way that I'm going to compete with Aspen, nor am I interested in it, you know. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to start something that was really focused on different things. So the festival is um, has a lot of freedom for people to to do what they want want to be doing, whether it's practicing or playing chamber music or studying scores. Um, By the time they get to a certain point, um, I think people know what they need to do. They just need the time and the space to do it. So this is a festival for um, string players between the ages of 20 and 30. Um, So there's people who are undergraduates, graduate students, and, and young professionals. And it gives them the freedom and the liberty to do what they want Um, And I teach all day long. Anybody can play for me anytime they want to. Uh, I love working with all different kinds of instruments, all kinds of different repertoire, chamber music, solo music, audition repertoire. Um, And then also we we have an ensemble. We have an orchestra that plays contemporary music, the music of living composers. So that was, I felt one thing that was really unique um, that I didn't know of another place quite like it. And then the other part of that anti-festival concept that I had was was the financial one. So one of the big obstacles to having a career in music is, you know, like you said, student loans and debt and, mm-hmm. and everything costing a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and even if you make it as a musician, you know, that's down the road, right? And yeah. it's always a big question mark. So my I wanted a different model. Um, so my financial model for this, which is crazy. And every business person that I've talked to told me that I'm totally insane. Um, (laughs) And I think so too, except for that it works. So my business model is um, I tell each student, I talk to each person individually and and find out what they can afford to pay, have a really honest conversation about it. I say, um, I'm committed to helping you to try and be here. Um, What can you give to be here? And I will try and raise the money to make up the rest. Oh, and, wow. Do you have a, do you have a guideline? Do you say like, you know, this is how much it costs for you to be here, but you know, do, like, do you? Right. I do. I tell them what it costs me. Um, uh-huh. but I say, I don't, I don't really expect anybody to, to pay that because you know, you're a musician. Right. Um, and beyond that, I say, I'm not interested in having a negotiation or playing any games like, if you're honest with me, I'll be honest with you. Um, mm-hmm. And it's worked out really, really well. People pay a whole range of of um, of fees, but it's, you know, everybody's situation is totally different. But what I found is that, number one, um, people feel like their needs are being taken care of and they're being heard and they're being respected and supported. And yeah. it sets up a dynamic where, um, you know, honesty and kind of, generosity from both sides is is the kind of basis of the interaction and that that's the basis of the whole festival um so in that way it was it was really important to me you know setting up a a place where people could do the work they need to do without worrying about the money in a place where it was a good dynamic you know basically the festival for me was kind of a social experiment like what happens if you do things for the right reasons i.e the music uh, and treat people the right way. And um, our, our founding charter mission statement is that there's no jerks allowed. <laughs> and uh, you know what? It, in, as far as I'm concerned, it worked really well. Uh, it was this so crazy, did you have, crazy Do you have experience. a board? Like, do you, how do you raise the rest of the money? Funny you should ask. And if any of your listeners have $50,000, uh, give me a call. 
<laughs> How do I raise the money? Um, yeah. Since from the very beginning, I've been really lucky to have really generous people who are interested in supporting contemporary music, who are interested in supporting serious young musicians. Um, and so I've, I've, I've had some individuals who are really helpful and generous in that way. We've been able to get some grants um, from some foundations, which is really great. Basically, the answer is, is I just go around with my hand open and the puppy dog eye look and <laughs> just kind of beg all the time for, for, um, for funding. So we're, we're able to take tax deductible donations. And um, I think it's an amazing cause. It's, it's, it's investing in the future of classical music. And it's something that I really believe in. And I think, you know, when, when people hear what we do and they hear the music that these, these players make, um, you know, it's kind of a no brainer. It's an easy sell. It's, it's, it's a great, it's a great contribution. Um, you know, it's a concrete way to, to support the future of this, this whole business and, and of contemporary music and, and young players too. So I've been really lucky, um, but it's a lot of, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. Um, and constantly asking um, for money. Is that your job primarily? Do, you don't have a team of people who help you? Do you just? Uh, it's it's job? it's me. That's my job is raising this money so that so that all these amazing young players can can come and and uh, and be at the festival. Yeah. So when you decided to have this festival, how long did you work on raising the money before you put on the festival? Um, it was about the first time. You know, I had a, about a year lead time, but that was a year to kind of imagine what the festival would be and all of the logistics and, and everything. So it came together slowly and it came together at the last minute. Um, I, and it, it's like that every year. Like I never know if it's if this is the year where it's not going to work. And yet it always it always happens. Um, luckily. You know, like I said, it was a social experiment. It was also kind of an experiment for me to see what would happen if I tried to do something really ambitious, but something that I believed in strongly. Um, yeah. And I just kind of put it out there and crossed my fingers, and it's worked every year. So um, somehow it, it, it seems it always seemed to me that this is something that that is supposed to happen. It's supposed to it's supposed to work. It's a good thing that's that that we're doing. So, yeah. Well, what I love about it is the financial help and honesty that you have with music students because no one else will have that conversation with them when they go to school. Like you, you know, you try to get you try to get a scholarship if mm -hmm. they have any of that, right? And then after that, you have to go to the financial aid office and sign your life away. You right. know. Right. So this is this is an just an honest way of saying, look, I want you to be able to be free and have that financial burden taken off of you so that you can create, mm -hmm. which is something that I posted about the other day, because what if musicians were able to have multiple sources of income, you know, in the, when they, once they get to the real world mm -hmm. where they, where they can focus on creating amazing art. So that's the one thing I want to ask you next. I know that we've talked about this before, but um, do you also have entrepreneurial programs for them to figure out what they can do, you know, once they go out into the real world and figure out how they want to build their career? Yeah, we do. We do. So part of the festival, I mean, it's basically like helping young players to kind of make that leap from being a student to being a professional. So I coach them, you know, on, on technique, technical things and interpretation. We play contemporary music and work with the composers often um, of that music. We have a guest artist come in every year who's very prominent in the, in contemporary music. And, and part of that is also that that person has had a, a kind of career trajectory, which is unusual which right. is not the typical, you graduate, you get the gig and, you know, that's the rest of your life. Or you get, you graduate, you get management and you become a soloist. And mm -hmm. um, each, each one of the, our soloists um, and our guest artists has had their own kind of unique trajectory. Um, and I think that that's really important. So that, that I, I, 
bring them on not just as an amazing performer as a, or as an amazing advocate of contemporary music, but as somebody who has a really interesting outlook on having a career in music. So between that guest artist and then we have um, a resident entrepreneurial artist who comes into the festival too. Um, between those two things, I try and, and, and encourage that kind of broader thinking, that entrepreneurial thinking that I think is important to, to, to have it on your radar these days. Even if you get an orchestra job or you become mm-hmm. a soloist, everybody's an entrepreneur these days for better or worse. And I think in some yeah. ways it can be better. Um, but we have a, so our guest artist and our resident entrepreneurial artist talk to the, talk to the players at the festival about different conceptions of a career and different um, ways to reimagine what they're doing or, you know, just, just connect with people and whether that's colleagues or whether that's audiences, you know, um, or whether that's with social media, whatever it is, that's an important part of, of the building block of what the festival's about too. Yeah, that's great. Cause it's, you know, it's one thing to take the burden financial burden off of them for the moment, you know, that's fantastic. And I totally support it. And then at the same time, people need to start figuring out how they're going to take care of that problem outside of the festival later. Sure. You know, yeah. cause that's, it's such a big problem with musicians really, when you think about it, cause you don't, you don't make a lot of money in general, mm-hmm. you know, that's one thing that, um, I've noticed musicians don't really like to talk about either. I personally didn't even start talking about it on this podcast until recently, just because it's, well, really in our culture, we don't talk about it. Like Mm -hmm. I don't walk up to a person and say, Hey, how much money do you make? But also I I do, but that's, (laughs) but that's for the festival. (laughs) So, Hey, Tracy, Tracy, how much money do you make? By the way, (laughs) But, um, so but musicians don't make that much money. And then when you make, when you make quote unquote, the big bucks in an or in an orchestra job, then you, if you do that, if you get there, which is really hard, you probably live in a, one of the most expensive cities in the country. So sure, sure. it's like, it's, it's, there's a reality to it that musicians don't often think about. Right. So, yeah, um, and those, and those major orchestras, right. I, I mean, I think it's basically equivalent to getting a major league baseball, um, contract right i mean it is the numbers are similar but if you look at you know the starting salary for a major league baseball player it's way higher <laughs> than the yeah. top salary for you know a, a top 10 symphony orchestra player so um even the ones who quote unquote make it you know um and are filthy rich in the <laughs> in the terms of of musicians it's like you know kind of minimum minimum wage in major league sports or the corporate yeah. world and it's it's middle class, to be honest. Right. Like when you look at if you're gonna if you're gonna make less than you know around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, but you're living in San Francisco or right. or you know New York, right. you're gonna be living in the suburbs probably, right. or living in a small place. Right. You know? So right. it's well, true. I, I I decided pretty young. Um, I kind of had a an epiphany that that basically all I thought about all the time was music. And mm-hmm. that things and stuff and money were great, but it didn't actually change my life for too long. You know, like if I had, if I got something that was really great and I really loved, it would only make me happy for so long, you know. So I, I sort of decided, you know, on balance that that the music part of things was more interesting to me than the making money part of things. And I, I always just decided I don't, I just want to have enough of money so I don't think about it. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that amount has changed and will probably always change. But that's basically been my goal as a musician is just to make enough so I, I know I'm okay, so I'm not constantly worried about yeah. it. Yeah, I think that's most musicians' point of view about money. You know, you, yeah. you just want to be in a place where you're not struggling. Right. And But, yeah, you're right. The, the number changes because, you know, if, especially if you have a family or, you know, if you want other things, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, yeah, just being able to have that, you know, position in your life where you're not worried, it's not a problem for you. So, mm-hmm. so does the, do you actually make enough money? I mean, I know the festival is your, is a dream and it's a 
passion, but does it make you money enough to justify your, you know, your summer as far as? Justify my summer? You mean like justify 365 days a year, you mean? Oh, yeah, I guess you're right. It does take <laughs> the whole year, but yeah. Yeah, it, yeah the festival, the, the, the two weeks of the festival is the easy part. Um, right. yeah. yeah, that's true. And I should know that, but. Um, yeah, but no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a year-round job, really. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, when I started the whole thing, I didn't know if it would work at all. Um, the goal was to, you know, have this kind of amazing place for your, for young players. And yeah. I set it up with a financial model in terms of the scholarship that really by no means should ever work. Uh, and the amazing thing is like we, we made money from the very first year. Um, and yeah, I, I, I take a salary, which That's is great. great. You know, and um, I, I I make sure that you know a lot of the money goes into the festival and goes into the priorities of the festival. But and and if I figured out what I really made from the festival, I would probably stop doing it. <laughs> you know, like the hourly <laughs> yeah, wage, the hourly, hourly wage. Of I course. would just stop. <laughs> so I, I just <laughs> on purpose never have really figured it out and use kind of being semi semi careless about math to my advantage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ignorance is the festival's bliss. So right, yeah. and plus, I mean, it's such a great program. I mean, probably a lot of that gets justified just because it's so great, and yeah. you love doing it. Yeah. Um, but you were mentioning before we started recording about how composition—it's harder and harder to make money because of you know royalties and all these different things. So, can you go into that a little bit about your com your compositions and composing and? Sure. Yeah. How I does mean, that work? I mean, the, you know, being a composer makes look of uh, being a performer look like, you know, <laughs> uh, a corporate titan, really. Um, really? Yeah, because, you know, as a performer, you can play weddings, you can play church gigs, you can play. And, you know, it might not be your life goal, but you generate money, right? Yeah. But um, as a composer, you know, there's very few people who make a living as a composer. I mean, like maybe 10. <laughs> who don't right. teach and who don't do other things, you know? Right. So, and 10 might be high. Um, so yeah, it's tough as a, as a composer and, um, you know, the economics of things are really stacked against that. Right. I mean, you, people get lucky and get commissions, but again, if you work out even a big commission, you know, quote unquote, um, the, the amount of work that goes into it, really, it's not really that much money. So, I've been really lucky that between being a player and being a composer and, and being a conductor, kind of that triangle of things, I've always made it work. Mm -hmm. um, and when things were, you know, slower in one of those, uh, one of those aspects of it, luckily the other things were working enough to, to make it work. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, it, they've all been parts of, parts of the equation for right. me, like, you know, spiritually and figure and literally, um, in different aspects at different parts. But yeah, being a composer, um, is, is difficult, but kind of amazing in its own way. You have to, you have to really, well, I think in general with music, but especially as a composer, you have to just not be able to not do it. Uh -huh. You know, you have to, you have to need to do it. Otherwise you just shouldn't do it. It's too hard. Yeah. You know? So that makes sense. Uh, yeah, for, for better or worse, I'm kind of, um, I've, I've got the, I've got the bug in three incredibly unlucrative <laughs> aspects, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I wish one of my passions could be like, you know, corporate law or something like that, but it, <laughs> I, I, I'm condemned to, to be obsessed about, you know, <laughs> three holes in the ground <laughs> in terms of, 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 of making money. But you know what? That's not what it's about. So. Well, maybe you could write a theme song to a corporate law TV show. Well, then... <laughs> well, sure, but here's here's the deal, right? I mean, I lived in LA for for quite a while. Um, oh, you did. You know, you you used to be able to make a lot of money, um, writing jingles and writing soundtracks and playing on soundtracks. But you know, that's that money is hard to get now too, right? So every every 
every person with a laptop and free software can write a lot of really, really bad music really quickly mm. <laughs> now. So, you know, that's competitive and, and that money is, is, is harder to get too. So it's not even, I didn't, I didn't even try too hard to break into that, that scene. Cause that's another, it's a whole nother career path, you know? Wow. So, but if anybody out there has a corporate law jingle need, um, I'm <laughs> certainly not above selling, selling my soul. Uh, <laughs> Any reasonable offer ex- accepted. Nobody's nobody's offered to buy my soul yet. I, I don't have a problem with selling it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put a link um, in the show notes. How to you know where the with the shopping cart for that? Yeah, yeah, it's on Craigslist right now. <laughs> so on on this show, I always ask my guests about their guest about their defining moment in their career. You know, like their crossroads moment where they right. decided to switch gears, right. um, and I call it the "screw this" moment. So, uh-huh. um, what was your moment in your in your life where you you had to go, you know, the unknown route? Sure, I, I think you know there there were many of them um, for me, but but kind of making that leap from being a player to kind of stepping off into the unknown as a as a composer and a conductor, um, I think there's a couple indelible gigs in my mind. Um, uh, when I was living in Honolulu, we were playing a show with Don Ho, um, who, you know, Don Ho was the guy who wrote Tiny Bubbles, which was this, this like silly kind of Hawaii tiki song. Um, and he was on the Brady Bunch. I think that was the pinnacle of his career. <laughs> but we were playing this outdoor show um, in the shell in the rain with Don Ho, who I think was at least like 107 by that point. <laughs> and, and clearly there were some substances involved uh, with his performance. <laughs> and he'd been doing this song, you know, for since, I don't know, the 60s, maybe eight shows a week in Waikiki every week. Oh my and God. I was sitting there playing this gig in the rain uh, with Don Ho and I, I had this great seat right behind him where I could see his teleprompter. <laughs> and and it kept scrolling back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, trying to catch where Don Ho was in the lyrics because he was totally lost. And it, it kept trying to like, you know, get him to getting on the right path with the lyrics. And, you know, and, and I just said, you know what? Actually, this is not what I really wanted to do when I worked so hard my whole life was, right. you know, play up playing a backup band in the rain for Don Ho, forgetting the word, <laughs> right? And then I realized probably actually my mic wasn't on. <laughs> right. So it actually didn't make a difference. So that was that was one of the kind of deeply, deeply profoundly uh, impactful screw this moments of my career. <laughs> Sorry, Don. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening. That's right. <laughs> That's funny. So that was, that was a moment where you were like, you know... It would be okay if I didn't do this for the rest of my life. That would be okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I get that. Yeah. So what is your next big goal in your career? Do you have some bigger things you see for the festival or, um, you know, compositions you want to do or? Yeah, well, I think I think the thing that's always driven me has been I just want to, I just want to be getting better. I want to, I want to be moving and growing and, and learning things. Um, so for the future, you know, I mean, this, the festival is a really big passion of mine. And, and one of the things that really makes me tick is working with young people and working with great repertoire and working with composers and playing new music and, and, and making things, just making things. Um, so I want to do that. I want to do that more. I want to do that in different places and with different people. And uh, I want to have that become a bigger and bigger part of my life because that's what I really feel, um, kind of gets me out of bed in the morning, you know, and with, with conducting and with composing and, and teaching, I, I want to be doing more of it and better of it and working with, um, great people who, 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 you know, inspire me and and make me scramble and try and try and get it, get it together finally. (laughs) But like with the money, you know, the Gold Coast, the goalposts keep moving, right? So I just want to keep moving in that direction and and, um, working with better and better people and making better and better music. That's great. So So with your festival, while I'm thinking of it, um, 
Are there still openings if someone's listening to the podcast and they want to apply? Is it still open for this year or are you filled up? We're or basically what? filled up. Um, uh-huh. we, we always get maybe one or two last minute openings. Um, and uh, usually there's a, usually a, a violin opening at the very last minute. Um, but any, you know, in the future, we're, we're doing this from scratch every year, you know. Okay. So I'm sure as, as you listen and as this goes into posterity, you know, the iPodsterity, <laughs> <laughs> um, people in the future will hear this and, and uh, hear about the f- festival and apply. You know, yes, there's... I'll definitely put the link in the show notes so it'll be there forever. And um, is it only strings or can any instrument apply? Uh, for now, it's only strings. It's only strings. And we'll see in the future if that's going to expand. But um, it's it's small on purpose, you know, to, to create a very cohesive and intimate, um, intense atmosphere. But who knows in the future? I'd love to do more. Um, and uh you know, I'm, I'm really committed to, to supporting the, the, the players in the right way. So I don't want to expand things in a way where I can't make that commitment to help them to be there. So that's, that's another thing. You know, there, there will be openings in the future for the festival for players and uh, maybe in the future for, you know, brass and woodwinds and percussion and singers. Um, but I would love to invite anybody who's interested in, in making a donation a tax deductible donation to the festival to, to do so because it's basically we're a, a we're a constantly running Kickstarter campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know five bucks, ten bucks, fifty bucks, fifty thousand bucks, it's all good. And uh, right. I would I would love to you know if there's people out there who who hear about the festival and say hey that that sounds like a really good idea that's something I can get behind and and um, I want to I want to help with that I want to make it you know any kind of contribution to, to what we're trying to do, please, please, uh, m- consider making a gift. You know, we take tax deductible donations. Our, our website is next, fe- next slash fest.org next hyphen fest.org. I'm sure you'll put that up on the website. I will. But, um, yeah, I would love for the people who listen to this, who I know are deeply involved in, in the business of music and, and, and how to make it work. If anybody wants to help out, I invite them to do so. Great. And where is the festival? I forgot to ask you that. So the festival uh, is in New York and Connecticut. So we do one week up at this beautiful place called Music Mountain up in northwest Connecticut. It's out in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we do one week in New York City where we're, we're working with composers and choreographers and playing concerts and doing workshops in New York. Oh, so you move everybody. We move everybody. So, wow, that's cool. <laughs> that's one word for it. <laughs> <laughs> and so where do you stay once you go in the city? Uh, well, we have to find all that stuff, you know. So I, I'm committed to, to making sure that everybody's taken care of in terms of housing and, and everything. So, um, Do you like host family kind of situations? No, we don't. Oh. We don't. We, we put people up um, in we – find, we find places to put people up. Um, and try and treat them, you know, like, like artists, the host family thing I think is, can be great, but is always kind of fraught with peril. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So, and, and I, and I want people to feel like, you know, they're not walking on eggshells in somebody else's home, you know? So that's part, that's part of what I, what we commit to trying to do. So. That's cool. That's very cool. I love it. Well, I'll definitely make sure the website is in the show notes of the podcast so people can link to it. And yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you two more questions. What is one habit or behavior that you've developed that has made the most difference in your career so far? Well, I don't know about one, but I would say like worry, panic, and fear. Can that count (laughs) as one? (laughs) Um, yeah. I mean, the, the great thing about being, you know, kind of curious on all these different fronts and trying to do basically three different things is that I feel like I'm constantly behind and failing in at least one of them at, at a time. <laughs> so um, it's a great sense of motivation to kind of keep keep going. But I think I think a serious answer would be persistence, you know, just to, to keep on doing it. Um, and as hard as it is to 
to keep on going when it just seems like it won't it won't happen um you know i think yeah. one of my greatest gifts is being really stubborn <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, those are all such everything that you listed, even your joke answer is really entrepreneurial when you think about it, because, you know, when you decide to do something that's out of the ordinary, <clears throat> it's entrepreneurial, it's not something you know how to do. Like when you decided to have a festival, you never had a festival before. Right. So the, everything that you did was new. And that's, that's the whole thing. So mm -hmm. that's what's so inspiring about it. Whenever anyone does something like that, I want to know how and, and what they went through to do it because it's supportive to everyone who's thinking about doing that, including myself, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're, podcast. you're doing a podcast, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah. And it's in, and the, the hard knocks are built in to it. And oh, uh, yeah, yeah, they're there. You know, we all want to, we will, we will all want to quit for some part of every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but just being, being really stubborn and, and just a little bit stupid, I think helps. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And yeah. so who in the classical world inspires you and tell me why? Well, you know, I think, I think it's a type of person. Um, and I would say like Leonard Bernstein is that kind of type of person or Yo-Yo Ma is that type of person. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is really curious and, um, kind of sees the wide picture of what music is and how music, the different parts of music and how fit music fits into the world and education and philosophy and, and all these things. Um, and somebody who's kind of constantly reinventing themselves and challenging themselves and putting themselves in uncomfortable positions, you know, and I think that, that both of those did um, do that. You know, Bernstein did that and Yo-Yo Ma is constantly doing that. Yes. And that type of person, you know, has always been really inspiring to me. Um, somebody who who sees the enormity of the whole project and kind of gets jazzed by that. Yes. I love that, the enormity of the whole project. Because, you know, that's one thing I love about Yo-Yo Ma is that he's always looking how to... Uh, reach more audiences and reach more people with his message and, you know, the Silk Road project and all that stuff. He's just really, he's always got his finger on the pulse and mm -hmm. he's always, he's just always looking to reach more people and, and yet he's always stayed so grounded. I and mean, he's like one yeah. of the, you meet, you meet him and he's just like, he introduces himself like as if you don't even know who he is. Hi, I'm yeah. Yo-Yo. Really? Yeah. I didn't <laughs> You know, I met him once and I was like, and he introduced himself to me and I was like, that is so down to earth that you, you know, he doesn't yeah. consider, oh, you, you know who I am, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, you know, I think kind of one example of that is, is often or often when he's playing a concerto with an orchestra, he'll sit in with the orchestra yeah. for the second half. And so actually that happened with, with me in, in Honolulu, he was playing Dvorak concerto and the second half he came in right before the second half started, you know, I was playing in the bass section in the back and the stage manager brought out an extra chair and put it right in front of me. Whoa. And then, you know, who should come out and sit in the last stand in the cello section, but Yo-Yo Ma, right? Oh my God. Um, certainly doesn't have to do that. And I know he wasn't getting union scale for that part of the gig, <laughs> <laughs> but he wants to, you know, he, 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 He's a soloist, but he loves orchestra music too. So I, I leaned over. I said, if I'd known you were coming, I would have practiced more. And he just <laughs> laughed. He's, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. So. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Well, Peter, thank you so much for being on today. This was so enlightening to hear all about the festival. It's so different from all the other festivals. And um, I wish I could go to it. <laughs> well, you know, start learning viola. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everyone should learn viola. Well, I want to actually, but that's another that's another story. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me on. I really I love talking to you, and I really love what you're doing. And and you know yeah. this is such a crazy time, but it's also such a um, an amazing time in music that that people can actually do a lot of things that weren't possible before. You know, so I, yeah. I love that you're highlighting all of the different ways that people are doing innovative things and kind of trying to create a community of people who who uh, are doing these things and, and inspiring each other. So thanks yeah. for that. And thanks Thank for having you. me on.
Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Casey. And everyone who's listening, if you're enjoying Crushing Classical, please write a review on iTunes and come and join the conversation on Instagram at Crushing Classical and on Facebook at facebook.com slash crushing classical. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.